My assistant helped me this morning. <laughs> well, welcome to Withville Baptist Church. And what a blessed morning it is and what a blessed rain we're getting right now. A good steady rain. And uh, I'm not Janet, so but Janet's off today and she asked me to open church for her this morning. I want to share with you a Billy Graham's Einstein speech this morning. On January 2000, leaders in Charlotte, North Carolina, invited their favorite son, Billy Graham, to a luncheon in his honor. Billy initially, initially hesitated to accept the invitation because he was battling Parkinson's disease. But the Charlotte leader said, we don't expect a major address. Just come and let us honor you. So he agreed. After wonderful things were said about Dr. Graham, he stepped up to the rostrum, looked at the crowd and said, I'm reminded today of Albert Einstein, the great physicist, who this month was honored by Time Magazine as the man of the century. Einstein was once traveling from Princeton on a train when the conductor came down the aisle, punching the tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached in his vest pocket. He couldn't find the ticket. So he reached into his trouser pockets. It wasn't there. So he looked in his briefcase, but he couldn't find it. Then he looked in the seat beside him. He still couldn't find it. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued on down the aisle punching tickets. As he was ready to move to the next car, he turned around and saw the great physicist down on his hands and knees looking under his seat for the ticket. The conductor rushed back and said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry, I know who you are, no problem. You don't need a ticket, I'm sure you bought one. Einstein looked at him and said, young man, I too know who I am, but what I don't know is where I'm going. <laughs> Having said that, Billy Graham continued, see the suit I'm wearing? It's a brand new suit. My children and my grandchildren are telling me I've gotten a little slovenly. In my old age, I used to be a bit more fastidious. Uh, so I went out and bought a new suit for this luncheon and one more occasion. You know what that occasion is? This is a suit in which I will be buried. But when you hear I'm dead, I don't want you to immediately remember the suit I'm wearing. I want you to remember this. Not only do I know who I am, I also know where I'm going. Amen. So let us pray. Lord, we lift up our church family, friends, our country and state, and the county as we pray for your healing power, love, grace, and guidance. We pray for the safety of our military, police, fire, and first responding personnel. Guide and direct us in all we say and do. Be with Pastor Tim as he delivers his message to us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now let us worship our Lord.
wonderful rainy day it is. Amen? Amen. It's been nice to hear the rain last night and this morning, and hopefully it will continue more this week. Um, appreciate the Lord bringing the rain. Psalm 84, verses 1 through 4. Listen to these words. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord Almighty. My soul yearns, even faints, for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh cry out for the living God. Even the sparrow has found a home and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may have her young, a place near the altar. Lord Almighty, my God, my King, and my God, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They are ever praising you. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, as we come to you, we want to acknowledge that you are a great, a powerful, an almighty, but a very close God. A God who wants to be involved in our lives in deep and rich and personal ways. A God that wants to guide and direct our steps in every way that we go. And Lord, we realize that as you're that kind of God, that sometimes we turn away from you. Sometimes we've done it without even knowing it, and sometimes we willingly do it because we're not sure we want to follow. So we come before you right now and we confess to you our sins. And we ask for your forgiveness. We ask for your mercy. We ask for your grace. May we know your cleansing power and may we understand in a deeper way what Jesus Christ has done for us. That we might be able to step fully into your presence because now we can. Because we have placed on ourselves the very righteousness of Jesus Christ. And we can stand in your presence in such a way that we can listen to you. And that we can speak. And that we can even, Lord, climb up in your lap and just allow you to wrap your warm arms of love around us in such a way that it brings us comfort and peace. We thank you for Jesus Christ, who makes all of that possible. We thank you for what he has done for us. We thank you for his sacrifice. But most of all, we thank you for the empty tomb. Because we know, Lord, not only do we have atonement for our sins so that we can be at one with you, but also you have victory over death. And death is nothing for us to fear anymore. For we truly can walk through that threshold. And we can stand in your presence one day because of what Jesus Christ has done for us. Thank you. Thank you for those who have gone before us also. Those that prepared this country so that we might live and follow you in the ways that you are calling us to live. We also thank you, Lord, for those who have prepared this church on this street corner. And we ask that you would guide us and direct us to understand that in deeper ways the sacrifices that others made so that we could have this place to gather here today and worship you, praise you, and lift up your name in all that we do. Lord, we thank you for those who walk this journey with us, that we can share this journey in such a way that not only do we have accountability, but that we can learn from each other's journeys together. Thank you, Lord, for that. We come to you with many concerns upon our hearts. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We ask that you bring them the comfort that you can. Help them not to let go of the memories, but to be able to walk forward in life and enjoy life even at the loss of a loved one. We also pray for those that need the medical touch 
bring a healing touch to them, whether it's through the doctors or just through the miracle of you doing it, Lord. We think of so many that we know that are sick. We also thank you for the gift of a new child in the family this week. We ask that you would be with that family and that you would lift them up and help them as they make adjustments. Going from three in a family to four. Guide them and direct them and help them. We also pray, Lord, for our witness in the midst of this community. That it might be a witness that is strong. A witness that draws people to you. A witness that encourages people to walk in your ways. Lord, please, guide us, direct us, and inspire us to be your people and to bring glory and honor to you and your kingdom. Be with us now as we pray the words of your Son, Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. You can do better now. Come on. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> I want you to stand with me as you sing an old familiar hymn entitled Love Lifted Me. Let us stand, if you will, please.
soloist George Beverly Shea gave his testimony one night and I listened to it and I realized then that he wrote the song I'd Rather Have Jesus and he was going through a crisis at that time and I want you to sing the song with us this morning I know most of us know it he wrote the song, wrote the words in 1938 I'd Rather Have Jesus sing with us <laughs> Yeah. 
This is a scripture that you're probably familiar with. I want to say something I never noticed before as I read this scripture. Many of your Bibles probably have a title at the beginning of this passage that says the parable of the Good Samaritan. I want you to understand that uh, titles were not part of the original books. Somebody added the titles later. They were not part of the original gospel. And in this parable, not once does it ever say good Samaritan. It says Samaritan, but it doesn't say good. And we put those two words together in our culture because we've heard them so much. But I want you to just listen, Luke chapter 10, verse 25 down through verse 37. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied, how do you read it? The expert in the law answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, Who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, he passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, and he gave them to the innkeeper. 
Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. I know the whole world right now seems to be in a great amount of turmoil. So many countries are having things turned upside down. So much violence and so much hatred and so much separation and so much division seems to be happening in almost every country. People are grabbing for power in places around the world. Political systems are being overturned. I don't know if you saw the news this morning about Sri Lanka. But in Sri Lanka, they have overrun the president's house. And everything is being turned upside down in that nation right now. Things in the UK are being turned upside down by conflict and division and discord and slander. Things in our country are happening the same way, aren't they? People are dividing over issues. They're dividing on this side and that. If there's one thing that we need to hear right now, in a country of separation and division, we need to hear this passage about love. In a country that is separating themselves from one another and causing divisions, whether it's political, whether it's religious, whether it's cultural, whether it's race, whether it's age, there's all kinds of divisions in our country right now. And we really need to hear a message about love. My major professor that you've heard me talk about many times, Dr. E. Glenn Henson, I can remember him saying a couple of different things about God's love. One, he said, what this world needs is what God has given the church. And that is love. That's the one thing that we have as church folks that definitely needs to be given to this world. We need to be giving our love out. We need to be acting our love out in the midst of this world. Because there are people that need to know they're loved. There are people that are stepping out and doing horrendous things because they don't love, because they don't think they're loved, because no one maybe has shared with them that God loves them. The other thing I can remember Dr. Henson saying is that God's love energies are always pouring down upon us. And all we need to do is open up like a flower to the sunshine and receive them and let them change us and pass that on to this world. God is always loving on us. God is always reaching deeper into our lives. God is always asking us to open up even further. You know what I'm talking about. There's so many people in this world that are so wounded and have been so hurt by so many different things, they don't even know how to open up anymore. Or they're afraid to open up. Because if I open up, somebody can hurt me. But I want to say that we need to open up to God's love. I remember as a child, my mother had some plants in the backyard that I always thought were truly amazing. They were called four clocks. Anybody know that plant? 
It's an absolutely beautiful flower. But here's the thing about four o'clocks. They don't open up until around four o'clock in the afternoon. That's why they're named that. It takes the time for the sun to warm them up. It takes the sun, time for sun to just be down upon them and come about four o'clock, they open up just as beautiful as can be. It takes some time. Now I've learned as an adult there are other varieties of the four o'clock in case you want to come to me and tell me my information's wrong. There's other varieties that open at different hours of the day. Okay? It depends on where they come from in the world. They're not native to this country. But these four o'clocks open up once the sun has warmed them up. Look at this. It says that a man learned in the law. A lawyer. But we're talking about biblical law. He comes to Jesus and said, what must I do to be saved? I love what Jesus does. Every good teacher knows how to do this. Every good teacher knows exactly how to do what Jesus did. He says, Jesus, what must I do to be saved? He says, you tell me what you think. Jesus doesn't answer his question. He asks another question. You tell me what you think. And the man quotes two scriptures. One from Deuteronomy and one from Leviticus about the first one about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And the second one from Leviticus chapter 19, he quotes, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you've answered well. You know your scriptures and you understand them. Now go and do likewise. Now the man says, oh, I got a better question, though. Bet he can't answer this one. Because the man has in his mind, I want to limit this. And I want to prove how good I am. Jesus, who's my neighbor? Jesus answers by telling a story. And he tells this story about a man. We don't know who the man is. But he tells this story about a man that's traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho. Now the reason it's called down in this case is because of elevation. Okay? He's traveling from a high point in the land, just as the Shenandoah Valley, those that you know the Shenandoah Valley, to travel north in the Shenandoah Valley is called down. Because the Shenandoah Valley starts at a high peak in the south and moves down towards the river in the north. So whenever you read your history about people going down the Shenandoah Valley, it means they were going north. It doesn't mean they were going south. Because we're talking about elevation. The same thing here. Because Jericho is actually a little north of Jerusalem. So they're going down, it's off towards the east, he's going down towards the river. This is a dangerous road to travel. There's many places that are constricted. There are many places that people can hide. And robbers have hid in order to rob this man. We don't know what they took. It doesn't tell us. We have no idea. We don't even know if he had a lot of stuff with him. It just says that he was traveling he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes. They beat him and they left him half dead. That's all we know. A priest happens to be going down the road. And instead of walking on the same side of the road as the man, he walks on the other side. A Levite, which would have been somebody who served in the temple, not a priest, but he was of the same family, but he served in the temple as a servant in some way. He does the same thing. He crosses over and he crosses on the other side, away from the man. And then a Samaritan comes. This is not as shocking to us as it would have been in Jesus' day. 
Okay? Samaritans are half-breeds. They're not pure Jewish folks. They're people that have intermarried with foreigners. They're people that are not as good as the pure Jews. So the Jews hate the Samaritans. The Jews say that we're supposed to, to worship in Jerusalem. But the Samaritans, since there's this hatred going on between the two, the Samaritans build their own temple and don't come to Jerusalem because the Jews won't let them because you're half-breeds. Now, I don't know what that would mean for us in our country and our culture, but here's what I would ask you to imagine. Think of someone you don't like whether it's because of their race, whether it's because of their age, whether it's because of their different culture, whether it's because of their political persuasion, pick the one that you would hate the most and hear Jesus say, that one stopped and helped. That one stopped and helped. All of us have a little bit of a bent that we, there are people that we set off in that category. You may not admit it to me, but there are. There are people that you look down upon. There are people that you feel because of their status in life, their state in life, their lifestyle, whatever it might be, they're much lower in class than you. That's the one that stopped and helped. Not the ones that went to church. Not the ones that believed in God. Not the ones that knew the scripture. Now some come along and say, well, the Levite and the priest, they have a duty to the temple. And that they're not supposed to handle dead bodies other than those of people in their own family. And even if they do, they're excluded from serving them. So they have a responsibility. They really, it doesn't say the guy's dead. It says he was left for half dead. Think about the places you've been where you have crossed over the road in order to pass by at the greatest distance you can from someone else. I don't know about you, but I, I feel uncomfortable with homeless folks man, panhandling when I drive in the city. I turn away from them so that I don't look at them. I'll be honest with you. See a row of them on the street? I might cross the street and cross and continue on down the street on the other side. We need to identify this. That's not love. I know somebody might say to me, well, you know, if, if they were more responsible, they wouldn't be in that position. How do we know that? These people passed by on the other side of the road. The one that was hated by the people that passed by stopped and took care of him says he put wine on his wounds. That would have been an antiseptic in their day. He put oil on the wounds. That would have kept the skin soft so that maybe it would heal better. He dressed his wounds. He put him on his donkey. He carried him to the inn. He left him at the inn. And he said, here's two days wages one denarii was one day's wages. Here's two days' wages to take care of this man. When I come back, if he owes you more, I'll pay the rest. No limit. How did he not know, or how did he know that the innkeeper wasn't going to go, oh, I just got two days' wages and put the man out? He's not staying here, that bum of a person. 
He's half dead. I, I'm not going to have him dying in my end. The Samaritan knew that this man would be taken care of by the innkeeper. Incredible story, isn't it? And Jesus, once again, really doesn't answer the man's question. He's a good teacher again. Look at what he says. He tells him the story, and then he looks at the man and he says, Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? I want you to notice, too, that the lawyer, the expert in the law, only says, the one who had mercy on him. He doesn't say the Samaritan. Can't speak that word. He says the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus says, go and do likewise. The man asked that whole question so that he could justify himself. You know, this parable answers the question... Who is our neighbor? It answers that question, doesn't it? Who is our neighbor? We can kind of say that Jesus didn't answer him. But I'm willing to say he did answer him, but made the man say the answer. Instead of coming right out and looking at him and saying, Gentlemen, every person you see is your neighbor. He said, let me tell you a story. He said, now from the story I've told you, which one was the neighbor? Well, the one that had mercy. The one that helped. One of the things that always helps me as I study scripture is to place myself in the midst of the story and to imagine myself right there. I want you to imagine, I want to give you a minute, I want you to imagine yourself as the man who's half dead. Place yourself in the story as the man who was left half dead on the road. What would you be hoping for? What would you be praying about? What would you wish for? You're half dead. They've stolen your clothes. They've taken everything else you had. And you're just laying on the road. Put yourself right there in that story. Imagine that you see somebody walk by on the other side of the road. You don't know who they are. You don't have any idea who they are. Maybe you're moaning and groaning. Maybe you're trying to get their attention. They walk by on the other side of the road. How do you feel? What did you hope would just happen? And it not only happens once, but it happens twice. Here comes somebody else. Maybe they can help you. And they walk by on the other side of the road too. How do you feel now? You're laying half dead on the road. Your possessions have been stolen. You don't know if you're going to make it till sunset. And you've just watched two people walk by you. Can you put yourself in that place? 
can you realize there's a good chance that sometime this week you'll see somebody in that place? Now, I want to admit, there's a lot of folks that are pretty good about wearing masks. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm just fine, no problems. When really their life is probably turned upside down. But they don't even feel comfortable enough to tell you. They don't feel open enough to share that with you. I wonder why. Maybe it's because they're afraid if they open up, they're going to be hurt even further. Maybe it's the, this standard old thought, nobody wants to hear the problems I'm having. Maybe it's just the thought that I hear sometimes from folks, well, I can't complain because if I do, nobody's going to listen. You know what? That's a pretty good clue that something's going on, that that person needs help. That's a pretty good clue that in one way they're laying half dead on the road. Because they probably thought of something they could complain about. And then they decided, no, nope, not going to. Because people aren't going to listen to me anyway. I'll just continue to carry my hurt with me. And maybe the person that's laying there half dead on the road, as two people walk by, finally go, what's the use? What's the use? Nobody cares about me. Nobody loves me. Nobody reaches out to me. Nobody helps me. Even when it's so obvious. I will admit that sometimes I talk to people and I ask them, how's it going? Oh, everything's just fine. And sometimes I have this tendency to look at them and say this. Now tell me the truth. Because I know something's not fine sometimes. Now tell me the truth. Don't tell me that nice pleasing answer that, well, nobody wants to listen to my problems anyway, so I'm not going to share. So, oh, everything's fine. No, it's not. I can tell it's not. You see, that's love. Love says, no, open the door. I want to help you. I want to encourage you. I want to lift you up. I want to help you to grow in your relationship with God. Now I want you to place yourself in another place in the story. But bring the story to today. Now ask yourself, in our day, could you be the Samaritan for whoever needs help? Could you be the Samaritan for whoever needs help? Not back in Jesus' day. In our day. Could you? Or, number one, are you so busy I don't have time to? So therefore, I'm on a cross on the other side of the road because, man, I got my agenda, I got my things I got to get done today. Or do you cross on the other side of the road because you don't like the way the person looks? Looks like they haven't taken a shower in a week or so. I really don't want to go help them. They happen to have this, that, or the other, which I don't approve of, so I'm not helping them. I can name some things, but I'm not going to name things. I'm going to let you name your own things. What is it that would keep you from being the Samaritan? 
What is it that will keep you from staying on the same side of the road and helping that person? Why is there division in our country? Because people would rather fight. Why is there violence happening? Because people don't know how to sit down and talk with one another. Why are people being hurt? Because people don't know how to sit down and just share. The book that I'm reading with the staff right now by Henry Nowen. Um, help me, the title is Coming Home. <coughs> Henry shares a, a story that's kind of modernized in there. It comes from the Desert Fathers and Mothers, which was a, a time in Christian history, in the early part of Christian history, where people moved out into the desert to try to get away from the ways of the world so that they could be better Christians. And sometimes they have some stories of incredible wisdom, and Henry updated this story some to make it more uh, attuned to us. And he talked about this couple that they decided, let's have a fight. We've never had a fight. You've met those people that will tell you that, right? Oh, we've been married 50 some odd years and we never had a fight. First thing I always thought was, you bunch of liars. That's the first thing I thought. You're lying to me. You can't tell me you've been married 50 years and you never had a fight. And then the second thing I, I realized, it probably meant that they, if they never really had a fight, it probably meant they never talked about the things they needed to. We're just not going to talk about that. Because it would lead to a fight, and we're married, and we're not going to fight. So they just didn't talk about the things that needed to be talked about. That's what I've learned, by the way. Maybe they weren't liars. But this couple decided, let's have a fight. And the, and the lady said, well, I don't know how to have a fight. And he said, it's really, really simple. He says, I'm going to pick up this object, this thing here, and I'm going to call it mine. And you say, no, that's mine. And we'll have a fight. So he picked it up and he said, this is mine. And she said, Okay, you can have it. You know what? Sometimes our divisions can be solved that simply. By choosing not to be part of the division. Not going to do it. You know, folks, we need to show love. And sometimes love says, I'm not going to be part of your fight. Sometimes love says, I'm going to do something. I'm going to help you. I'm going to go out of my way. Did the Samaritan not go out of the way? He took care of the man. He left money. He left two days wages. Don't think about it as two coins. Think about it as two days wages is what he left. How far would two days wages go for you? And he left that with the stipulation that when I come back through, if more is needed, I'll pay that bill too. Twice in this passage, Jesus tells the lawyer, do this and you will live. Plus, he said, go and do likewise. You know what? 
It sounds like to me this is about action. This is about doing something. This is not about passing by on the street and saying, Oh, brother, I'll pray for you and I hope everything will be all right. By the way, the book of James has a scripture specifically for that. The book of James says, If you see your brother or sister in need, you have sinned. I know, there's all kinds of answers that go with this. Well, if they made better choices in their life, if they didn't do this and they didn't do that, I'm just kind of wondering what would happen if we just loved them? Because you see, in this passage, Jesus tells the lawyer, do this and you will live. Plus, go and do likewise. Do this and you will live. Go and do likewise. When will we hear that love is not just a feeling? When will we hear that love is not just an emotion? It's about action. So I leave this question with you. Since action is the key, will you be about the action of love this week? Since action is the key, will you be about the action of love this week? That's the only way we're going to change the separation and division that's going on in this country. Love. Not crossing on the other side of the street, but stopping and showing by action love. Let us pray. Lord, we come to you and we ask for your insight and wisdom. Because this world is divided. This world is separated by many different types of divisions. And even our own country is so divided and so separated right now and so confused. Guide us to be people that will bring love that will show love, that will do the action of love in this world. That one by one, hearts might be transformed to come into your kingdom. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. What step do you need to take? What action do you need to take? Whatever it might be, I'll be here to receive you if you want to pray about it, you want to talk about it. But I pray that the action that the Holy Spirit is asking you to take, you will take it today. Whatever it might be.